Hallelujah. Um, I want to start off quickly by, uh, I have about 30 minutes to speak. I want to uh, quickly just uh, just honor the pastor and the leadership for putting this together. I know um, we would have, of course, enjoyed and, and uh, would rather like to meet in person. Of course, I, I was excited for that as well. Um, I have never had the opportunity to go to an uh, Eagles gathering in person. Every time I tried to go, my mother would bring some kind of excuse. So I never was able to do that. But I definitely do hope that we'll be able to together physically next year. But as we are here now, we still expect for the Lord and we're trusting God to bless us with whatever he's doing in our midst in this time. Now, of course, our representative figure uh, for this conference's theme is the eagle. And um, if you study the, the progression of an eagle's life, the altitude at which they're able to fly is a representation of the strength that they've surmounted throughout the course of their life. And when the eagle reaches its highest altitude of flight, it's when they're at their prime the prime of life. And um, I was studying that a little bit and it's, it's based on the, the strength that their wings have surmounted as they've learned to uh, fly and train in that, in that regard. And um, um, I wanted to use that as sort of like a, a simultude as a basis of my teaching. So my discourse today will be concerning building capacity to finish your course, building capacity to finish your course. We'll take our first scripture from book of Romans chapter 12 and verses four through five, the book of Romans chapter 12, verses four through five, and I read myself. He says, for just as we have many parts in one body and all the body parts do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually parts of one another. Paul here is using uh, an example of the human body and how every member of the body has its own unique function. And all these functions work together to them out. Sure that the body is working and is sufficient. And so it, it, remember the theme for the entire year is equipping the church as an army to possess the nations. And in army, um, there are different ranks. There's sergeants, there's lieutenants, generals, all these different things. And the essence is that they're all working together in their individual function to make sure that the army itself is, is, is operating effectively. And there are even some offices when they're not even in the battlefield. There are doctors, there are nurses, there are people who are in the technology space. And so there are all these different people operating in their own unique function to make sure the army is moving correctly. And so the idea is that when each member of the body is functioning to full capacity, the body can advance. You know, he's, he says the fivefold ministry is called to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that we can come together and be unified in the faith and, and begin to function as one body. So the, it's a corporate calling, it's a corporate assignment, but we each have our own individual uh, role to play. Again, so we're talking about building capacity to finish your course. Now, I wanted to just first off by um, laying the foundation for this, this teaching by explaining, uh, you know, the first assignment here would be to begin to discover how we can align ourselves to, the, to our course. And the first assignment in alignment is to find whatever misaligned you, right? To fix something, I have to be able to admit that a thing is broken. To clean something, I have to first admit that is, that's my mom calling, I have to admit that is uh, dirty. And so the idea is that you want to be able to look at and have some sort of measuring stick to determine if you're actually walking according to your course of life. So I actually wanted to begin this teaching by discussing uh, some, about four indicatives that people would usually use to be a simultude of their assignment. But many times if you check scripture, there are, uh, they have a, a, a representation. They can have a simultude of being a man's assignment yet they're faulty and they're not strong enough to be the, the full course of the man's life. We understand more as I continue. So I just wanna know four things that um, are not your assignment. That's the best way I can say it. Four things that we have to look out for that somebody can uh, uh, sort, to, sort of try to push as, as a simultaneous assignment, but it's not. The first I wanna talk about is your physical occupation. Your physical occupation here, um, I can look at a few examples here. Now, Daniel, Daniel in the Bible, a biblical figure, was a, by occupation, he was a political leader. He was a president, as the Bible said, one of the three presidents in Babylon. But his, his, his ordination, his assignment, he was a prophet. He doubled as a prophetic intercessor and as a prophet in Babylon. So the idea there that is that Daniel's, his calling in life wasn't to be a political leader. What God did, what God does sometimes is that when he sets someone on assignment, he may send them into what people will call a mission field. The um, the job itself is not the assignment, but there's somebody, there's, a, there's something they're supposed to do in that space that requires for them to hold that position so they can enter into that space. So you can ask a believer and they'll tell you, I remember one time I asked somebody, we were talking about purpose and they told me that their assignment is to be a nurse. 
and I understood where they were coming from, but the it's interesting. You don't have to be born again to be a nurse, right? You don't have to be born again to be a doctor or born again to be a lawyer, right? The idea is that, you know, you can be, now I'm, I'm, this is silly, but you can be a witch doctor and still be a lawyer. You know, in fact, we Africans know that there are politicians who do juju. So it's not even as if you have to be an upstanding moral person to, to hold these positions. But uh, for a believer to say that they're called to be a doctor, it's not accurate because the, the idea of, of you serving God is that God wants to call men to do things that they don't have the capacity to do themselves so that in that thing they're doing, God can be glorified. So I can't say I'm called to be a doctor. What I can say is that, um, for example, I can say that I'm called to the medical field, but my assignment is that I'm called to cure A, B, and C disease. And God has given me the grace and the intelligence to bring these cures for these certain diseases. That's an assignment. That's not a job. That's an assignment. I may hold that job so I can be in the space to fulfill that assignment. This is very important. Another example is um, Peter, the apostle. In fact, I'll use Paul, the apostle example. Paul was a tent maker by occupation. 99, in fact, I for three years of my Christianity, I didn't even know that until the third year because it, it, it's not important. He made tents for a living, but that's not what his assignment was. He made tents so that, in fact, the reason why he did that was so that um, he wouldn't be chargeable to the churches. He didn't want to have to depend on churches for a source of income, but it wasn't his assignment. He wasn't called to be a tent maker. So if you ask Paul what his assignment is, he told Timothy, I'm called to be an apostle, a preacher, and a teacher to the Gentiles. Yes, I'm called to be a tent maker. Of all the things that I don't know that's happening in heaven, I know for a fact there's nobody talking about Paul's exceptional tent making qualities. There's nobody talking about that. They're talking about what he was called to do on earth. So the idea here that you have to separate your job from your assignment. Again, another person I can use is Luke the Evangelist. Luke was a doctor. He called him, uh, you know, Paul called him the beloved physician. He was a doctor and a very good doctor and a very lucrative doctor, but that wasn't his assignment. Um, the second thing I want to, to, to talk about here is your position in church. I really have to rush. Your position in church is also not your assignment. Uh, Philip the Evangelist, he was one of the seven men that uh, the apostles called to be able to minister food to the, the Hellenistic Jews in the book, I would believe, Acts chapter seven, I think. Um, and he started off as a deacon, Philip. But after Saul persecuted the church and many Christians started to disperse, um, Philip became an evangelist. He started off as a deacon and all he was doing was uh, serving food to those Jews, but he became an evangelist. But if Philip had said his assignment in life was to be a deacon, a deacon it would be an error because God didn't call him to serve food because you don't need God to serve food. How, God can't be glorified in me serving food. You can be a Muslim and serve food. But what he was doing as an evangelist, you need God to do. And it's only God that can be glorified in you evangelizing because it takes power to save souls. And he's a spirit of power. So he can only be glorified in a man doing something only God himself can do. Every time God calls a man in the Bible, they always the first thing they always thought is, how could I do this? Jeremiah, how could I do this? I'm young. Uh, Moses, how could I do this? I'm a stammerer. Every time he called a man, they always had a reason why they can't do it. And that's what God was looking for so they can be glorified. Um, and so there's another one, Stephen the martyr. He also started off as deacon, but he began his preaching ministry and he became the first Christian martyr. So his assignment was deeper than a position he held in church. You could even, I'll even, I'll respectfully speak, and I can even go as far to say that you can say you're an elder, but you're, being an elder is not an assignment. It's an office. I can even say, I can even wake up and say, I'm called to be an apostle. Being an apostle is not an assignment. It's an office. It's like me saying, because if that's the case, then the day they are danger, you already fulfilled your assignment. If you're called, your only calling life is just to become an apostle. That means the day they laid hands, you already finished your assignment. You see, Peter and Apostle were both, Peter and Paul were both apostles, but they had individual and unique specific assignments. Paul was called to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter was called to bring the gospel to the Jews. Peter doesn't do what Paul's doing. Paul's not doing what Peter's doing, but they're both apostles. You see, there's a unique assignment. You see, there's something to do because if the assignment is just an office, the moment they hand you the office, you're already done. What are you going to do? You see, so Paul at the end of his life said, I've laid the foundation. He said, I finished my course. That means there was a time he didn't finish it. There was still more left to do. He had a work to finish. So there's time he didn't finish it. He had a specific assignment. If you ask Paul, he's going to tell you exactly what he's called to do. He's called to be an apostle in office, but the assignment is definitive. Jesus Christ is called to be the Christ, the Messiah, but the assignment is definitive. Throughout the entire course of his life, he had one mission, and that was to get to that cross. You can't say, I'm called to be the Christ. No, there's something he has to go do. And that's to die on the cross to provide the forgiveness of sins for mankind. So second, it's not your position in church. Third, it's not your passion. 
it's not simply what you're passionate about. I use myself as an example. Before I was born again, my passion was basketball, sports, basketball. Even at time it was fashion. I had all different kinds of all different whatever. And if you had asked me then and said, what do you want to do in life? I would have said, I want to be a basketball player because that's what I was passionate about. But the first thing that God did when he called me was he eradicated that passion. Now, people will say that, oh, you know, you have to find your passions and that's what God would do. It's not true. If you study scripture, the very first thing that God does to a man when he finds him is to kill whatever he was doing before he met him. Because you built a life separated from him. He wants to destroy that one you built so he can now begin to build his own. He's not going to, God doesn't compete with man. He's not building with you. You have to put that one down to pick his own up. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible says, unless a seed died, it abides alone. But if it dies, it becomes fruitful. It has to give up. You have to give up all these other plans that you're holding so that he can give you his own. The Bible says, uh, every person's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord examines the hearts. And again, in Proverbs 16, verse 1, he says, the plans of the mind and orderly thinking and orderly thinking belong to men, but from the, the Lord comes the wise answer of the tongue. So I can have many plans in my heart, but I have to exercise the capacity. Uh, I learned this actually from Rainer, Evangelist Rainer Bonke. When he wants to hear God, he'll sort of lay down all the ideas he has of his own heart, all his own passions and plans. And give them time to sink down. And as he gives them time to sink down, God's counsel always rises up. But he's not going to compete. It's not my will versus God's will. And we're fighting to see which one's going to be the better idea. We're not. Christianity is not creative. There's no creativity needed. I need to kill this one I have so he can bring his own. So it's not your passion. Number four, lastly, it's not your giftings or abilities. I know this one is very popular. People say you're called to do whatever you're gifted at. Um, Beyonce is a gifted singer, but she's not doing what God created her to, for her to do. Can, can we agree on that? She's like, she can sing very well. There's a, there's a Nigerian uh, minister called Victoria Renze. I don't know if you all know her. Victoria Renze is not, not respectfully speaking, she's not even that, she's not that good of a singer necessarily. She doesn't have a great voice. Jennifer Hudson probably sings better than her, but she, she's not walking. You see, Andy just said he loves her. She's a great worshiper, but everyone knows that when you hear her sing, it's not the singing that gets you. It's that she's walking in an assignment and there's an anointing on her life that does more than make you hear a nice voice. You want to say, you can hear, there are people who have heard her songs and demons were cast out. So what she's doing is deeper than just what she's gifted at. I'm sure she has other talents. It's not just about what you're talented at as your assignment. I can be a talented such and such and such and such, and it can be a product of a genetics. Sometimes if you're, you're, your family line people can sing well, you can also sing well. I know my family, they're very creative. My sister uh, is, is, in, is in the interior decor arena. So I'm able to draw and do certain things, but I, I'm not going to say I'm called to be an artist because I can draw well, or I'm called to be a singer because I can sing well. That's not a strong enough indicative of your assignment, you see, because it's not just gifting. There are people in the world who are using giftings and they're not, even Satan is still using the anointing God gave him to do other things. He was anointed with influence. That's why he was able to snag one third of the angels. He had an influencing anointing on his life and he's still using it to this day. And God didn't take it away, but he can't say that I, that's not, is that what God called him to do? No, but he's still using a gift. Moving on here. Um, now I want to begin to discuss with a few minutes left, identifying the course of your life, identifying the course of your life. And I'm going to uh, uh, end by discussing building a mentorship system and then eventually time conversion. But now I want to just discuss how to identify the course of your life. I'm going to point a few things. Now, firstly, the Bible says in um, Jeremiah 10, 23, I know Lord that a person's way is not in himself nor is it a person who walks to direct his own steps. So there are certain jurisdictions God has given man. There are certain things that are given to man to do. Men have the ability, once they're in a marriage covenant, to give birth to children. They have the ability to work, so on and so forth. But there are certain things that God has not given man to do. And Jeremiah is saying it's, it's not in a man to walk to direct his own steps. I mean, man isn't given the license to, to determine the course of life. As a man, you're not supposed to be able to sit down and say, this is where I want to be in 20 years. That's not, you're not spiritual. There's no, you don't, you're not supposed to have that capacity because your destiny is sealed in his hands. It's only him you have to go to and to unravel it. So he's saying that it's not in man. It's not giving man. Man doesn't have that liberty to sit down and decide, this is how my life will go. And he says in Proverbs 20, 24, a man's steps are ordained by the Lord. How then can a person understand his way? So your assignment must be found, not decided. It must be found. Not just like when your teacher gives you an assignment, you can't go to school and make up whatever, whatever thing you wanted to do. You have to find the assignment the teacher gave you. If the teacher gave you a math homework and it, it was 10 math questions and on the side, instead of answering the questions, you wrote the world's most beautiful poem, you still fail. They might recommend you to the writing teacher, but you'll, as, as it touches that assignment, you failed it. 
because there's no creativity needed. All you had to do was to do the assignment. So it must be found and your the objective is just to obey what he said to do. So your assignment must be found, not decided. And secondly, a man doesn't have ju the jurisdiction to decide the course of life. You see, now Jeremiah in chapter, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter one and verse four or five, you know what he said before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And he said, uh, uh, I approved you as my chosen instrument. And before you were born, I separated you and set you apart, consecrating you. And I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So that means Baba decided your destiny before you even had time to even think about it. He, he didn't ask for your consultation. He didn't sit down with you and say, okay, Randy, which one do you want to do? Which one are you passionate about? You, you have nothing to do with it. He decided it before you even came out into the world. So this thing is already written down. Just like the teacher, when they give you a test, they weren't sitting with you Thursday night before they gave it to you on Friday to ask you what questions you want to be on the test. They gave you a test and all you have to do is answer the questions. It's the same way because God is a king and kings don't wake up to ask the servants what they want to do. The king wakes up and crosses their arm and waits for the servants to come in and find out what the king wants to do. So your only assignment is to align to that. So he already decided your destiny without consulting you. You see, so I want to get to the first point I want to make about identifying your course is the uh, the ministry. I'm going to call the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm going to kind of read some scriptures for the sake of time. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a jurisdiction. The Bible says, uh, who knoweth the mind of a man except the spirit that which is in a man? And he says, in the same way, no one knows the mind of God save the spirit which is in God. So the Holy Spirit has the jurisdiction to search the deep and hidden things of God. God is a very hidden being. He declassifies things and it's for kings to search them out. But the, for the king to search it out, he has to know the spirit that has that jurisdiction. It's almost like your destiny is, is behind a door. And the Holy Spirit is the only one with that key. If you ignore him, you're not going to find the destiny. So the idea here is that the Holy Spirit is the one that holds the key for you to unravel that assignment. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so the uh, uh, you have to develop um, a system to be able to develop a serious relationship with him because he will unravel this thing. The Bible says, uh, the Holy, well, Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, um, um, he will take of me and show it unto you. He says, everything I've spoken unto you, he'll bring to your remembrance. So the idea is that everything that God has said about your life, he's given, he won't even tell you himself. He will give it, the father gives it to Jesus and Jesus gives it to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will sit there like this. If you don't acknowledge him, he'll keep his mouth shut. You have to acknowledge, see the Holy Spirit this sounds silly, but the way he operates is almost like, like, like he has a, a feminine operation. He has like a way, you know how women sometimes, uh, they won't, they almost feel unless you, they, they, you, they feel like you, you discern their value. You know, that thing where it's like, if you, if you haven't discerned that she's of high value, she won't pay you some kind of attention. That's how the Holy Spirit is. If he doesn't recognize that you value the authority he has over your destiny, he'll cross his arm like this. These guys are not serious. There's a way you have to begin to, if you read Proverbs, the Bible, um, Solomon spoke about wisdom and how he gave wisdom in a, in a woman's identity. He said, exalt her and she will promote you. Uh, seek for her as a seeking for hidden treasures. And the spirit of wisdom is the Holy Spirit. There's a way you have to relate with him as if you're, you're trying to prove that you value his presence. And the love language of the Holy Spirit is consistency. Consistency. He says, blessed are they which wait daily at my gates taking heed to my words. And this is the spirit of wisdom speaking. He's saying that when somebody is trying to prove their love for me, there's a way that they're consistent in seeking me. There's a way that they, and I know you've heard this so many times. I mean, we've grown up in church. We know, yes, read about the Bible every day. The problem is that people don't do it. How many, now respectfully speaking again, how many people will actually sit down every single day of their life and study scripture every single day of life and pray? It's not, I'm, I guarantee, I'm telling you it's not many people because it's not something you can do religiously. It takes a certain revelation. It's an understanding for you to know that I should spend time with my wife every day. It's not just because it's by force. There's something I like about this person that I want to spend time with her. There's something that I, there's an advantage or something. Maybe she's a wise woman and I'm gaining something. You have to discern his value and build that life of consistency. The second key I want to give here rushing is prophetic counsel and confirmation. Um, after that, which the Holy Spirit begins to affirm in your heart, what you're called to do. Um, it's the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. You have to begin to build a, what I call a mentorship system of people that can speak into your life and confirm with the Holy Spirit. Is you can't just wake up and say, and say, God, I called to be an apostle and just wake up anyhow and just brush it. No, who in your life, see, but who in your life sent you? Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to be able to, uh, uh, someone has to vet that what God is saying in your life is true. 
Timothy had Paul, Titus had Paul. All these men had different authorities. Even Paul, after three years in Arabia, he went and submitted his ministry to uh, 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 Peter, James, and Peter, James, and John. Oh, thank you, Ruth. Uh, Peter, James, and John. And, and he said that he, the reason why he did that is because he didn't want to run in vain. He didn't want to find out that the ministry he's doing, what he's doing, is not what God called him to do. Kenneth E. Hagin knew of a man that had done ministry for decades, and God told him by direct revelation that the man had not yet began his ministry. He's doing ministry, signs, miracles, and wonders, raising the dead, raising men, born again, salvation. There could be 100 million souls saved, but he's not doing what he's called to do. And there's a difference. So it's the same thing as when a teacher gives you a homework. You can write the world's most beautiful poem. You still fail because you didn't do what the teacher gave you to do. There has to be prophetic counsel. Um, um, so the idea here is that uh, you should have people, right, that know what you're called to do, and they can speak into your life and confirm. So if I had a vision, and I saw myself giving a presidential address. There can be people that I trust as voices in my life that can confirm that thing. Hey, Randy, I saw you. Da, 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 da. What that does is that it creates a track record of consistency. I can begin to move upon that vision with boldness because I know it's God that's speaking. But you can't say that you can't say I'm called to be an apostle. And your mom is saying, I see you being a prophet. And then your pastor says, I see you being a businessman. There's something wrong. If everyone is saying something different, there's something you have to go check. And it's happened to many people. They think there's something, but someone else is saying something else. This one is saying this. This one is saying that because all these different voices. And this is something Satan has done many times to confuse young people. They don't know who to listen to. This preacher says this. This one says this. This pastor says this. You have to sit. That's why I begin with the Holy Spirit. Sit down with the Holy Spirit and let him guide you into all truth. He's the one that begins to pick out who should be these voices in your life. The day before Jesus told, chose the 12 apostles, he prayed the whole night because he wants the father to lead him to which one of these men should I pick to be my apostle? He didn't just wake up and pick them based on who has the highest political class. No, it was by instruction. So you pick you don't pick a spiritual father because he has the most anointed ministry. You pick him because that's who God sent you for. That's the one. That's the one that can speak to you. So a man, a young person can be listening to one pastor, one minister on YouTube or one of these big guys. And yet the one that God has called them for, they trivialize because they think, oh, but he's not. Da, da, da. But that's the one that God will use to speak to your life. Never trivialize men. Men are doors in the spirit. A, your, your, one entire phase of your ministry can be held behind by one man. So if you ignore him, you're not walking to that thing. If you would, I learned this thing and I, st I started taking men serious. There's a way that we can try to try because we want to exalt the sovereignty of God and say, oh, forget men. Oh, it's just men. It's not just men. Didn't it take a man to save men? Wasn't Jesus Christ a man? Didn't it take Moses who was a man to save Israel? Everything God has ever done in this world, he did it by men. It took, it took a man to split the ocean. It took a man to save men. It took a man to heal the sick. It took, Benny Hinn's a man. But there are millions of people that have been healed by the power of God through his ministry. Never trivialize men. Prophetic counsel. Thirdly, uh, the inward witness. The inward witness. Do you know how that uh, you're born again? Um, and no angel ever came down and said, this day, I can tell you you're born again. There's nobody that signed a contract with you and confirmed that you're born again. But that thing where you just know that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know. That if Jesus comes today, you're going to heaven, but you can't even prove it physically. That's called the inward witness. The Bible says the spirit, the spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There's a way he can confirm in your spirit something. If you believe you're called to do something and you don't have that witness, it's not God. There's no, that's not how God leads people. He doesn't do anything contrary to his own spirit. There's a way the spirit has to confirm in you. The same way you know that you know that you know that you're born again. You should also know that you know that you know that you know that you have a certain assignment. That same boldness, even if Satan stands in your face and says, you're going to hell, you will laugh at his face because you know, you can't even explain it, but you just know. In the same way, that's the only way that you'll be able to, when the storms of life come, that's the only way you're able to continue because you know God said, if God didn't say, you don't have any confidence. That's why there was a time where Jesus was given an instruction by the father to go from one side of the river to the other side. And there was a storm and he was sleeping in the storm. Because, you know, if Baba said, we're going to this side, I, I don't care what storm is coming. I won't die because he said to go to this side. When a man has is moving by instruction, when they when he has the witness of the spirit, there's a boldness that comes to his life because, he know, he's not moving based on his own feelings. Or I, I feel like doing this. or I want to do this. or I feel like I'm called this way. No, one storm will come and you'll quit. That's why you see many times believers starting businesses here and there and then they just 
six months. This one started a last business. This one started this way, and then they just quit. And then, because they're not doing it by instruction. They don't have a witness that God sent them to do that thing. Even if your business fails 55 times, you'll continue because you know God said. God said, it's, you have a witness. You want to say, I'm saying, you have to master that communication for, uh, I'm going to say the word of the Lord. The Bible says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And that's when he told him before, uh, uh, before, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. It came by the word of the Lord. There are many times where a man's assignment was given to him by God speaking something to him that he told Jeremiah, I have called you to be such and such and such and such and such and such. It's very important. I want to move on here. Uh, number six, I'm going to note the peace of God. It has to be a peace in your spirit. See, there's a way that um, you can have authorities in your life that, or say, for example, your mother says, you, you know you're called into ministry. But your mother says, no, don't do ministry. You know, all these men have got to always take people's money. And she's telling you all these ways you do ministry. The only way that you'll be able to move in that direction, even though you might have somebody you respect that may not agree with what you're doing, is if you have the peace, what's called the peace of God in moving in that direction. In fact, if any, any, any spiritual man is sincere, the primary way that God leads men is peace. I can say that in my own experience and by studying scripture and by studying men, Kenneth E. Higgins said 90% of the communication between him and God was by peace. Simple. It wasn't some crazy encounter. He said he only had two encounters in his entire life, decades of ministry, only two. Every time he was led, he just had a peace making a decision. If he wanted to build a church, he had peace doing it. If he wanted to build school, he built a school called Rama. He had peace doing it. It wasn't an encounter he had. He just knew that I have a green light in my spirit to do this thing. You have to master that communication. Those two things, the inner witness and the peace of God are going to be the primary way that God leads you in this life. I'm telling you that for a fact. It's very true. When I first became born again, I thought when somebody said God sent to me, I thought they meant that God came down and spoke into their ear. What they really meant to say is that they 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 had a communication in their spirit. They tried to make it seem all mystical. And yeah, you know, God said, I'm good at it. No, it's just that they felt in their spirit to do something. Do you understand? So the idea there, it's the peace of God. Number uh, another one here is circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is the idea that your present circumstances have to agree with what you're called to do. Um, okay, another example can I use? If if wow, I use this one example some one time. I said that it, it's it's difficult to say you're called into a certain area if you know that you don't have the grace for that assignment. Um, how do I say this? This is not really an adequate example. It's the only thing I think of. It's like saying I'm called to be a singer and you have a terrible voice. It's not very adequate because I know I use the example of Victoria Renze, but I'm just using it to understand there's a way you can be called to do something. If you don't have grace in that area, you can't say you're called to do that thing. God can't send you to do something. It's like your mom sending you to the store to buy her something and then she doesn't give you the money to buy it. Just for example, like if, if God sends you, he has to give you equipment. You understand? Know if God, there has to be some kind of circumstantial evidence. You can't say that, um, for example, say you're, say you're called to be a teacher. One of the proofs that a man is called to the teaching ministry will be an insatiable hunger for scripture. There are certain signs of callings. For example, one of the signs of the apostolic office is, is strange miracles. You said, Paul said, the signs of the apostle was wrought among you in strange miracles and wonders. The sign, the signature of his apostolic ministry was the strange signs, miracles and wonders he did by the hand of God. You have to understand that. So there are signs of certain things that have to be confirming circumstantial evidence around what you believe you're called to do. Do you understand? So if I believe I'm called to the business sector, there's no way I'm called to business and there's no creativity in my life. There has to be some kind of signature there. Um, again, here, I'm going to end with this one before I go to building a mentorship system. Um, this one is simple, Christian ethics, right? Of course, your assignment has to be ethically sound. You can't say you're called to do something that's against scripture. You know, I'm called to admin I'm called to administer drugs and, and drugs that can harm people. Like just some random, I have heard people say things and it's like, God can't call you to do certain things. He can't call you to do something that's against scripture. I've, I've, God's called me to work at an abortion clinic. Like, Right. So you have to be sensible in that arena. Now, this is the second uh, part of the teaching. I want to talk about building a mentorship system. Um, Ruth, I know you said that uh, you said if I can add a little more time, can I have maybe just uh, just maybe seven more minutes? Just to be able to butcher this this last point. I would want to confirm or Pastor. Proceed. Yeah. Proceed. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Just seven more minutes just to finish this again here. I'm going to talk about building a mentorship system. 
Um, after that, you've located and tracked the coordinates of your assignment. The next thing that you have to do is to build a mentorship system. Um, you have to begin to identify that if you're called to a certain area, you have to find somebody, somebody in that area that has already obtained what you're trying to obtain. The Bible says, follow them who through faith and patience have obtained the promises. Follow them, meaning because they already went there. If I want to get there, I have to follow them. So your mentors are also your limitation. Show, a man, show me a man and show me his mentors and you can identify where he'll be in life. The Bible says walk with wise men and become wise. Why? Because there are certain things these men know and are engaging that are producing the result of them being wise. If I follow them, I'll begin to think like them and operate the way they operate, thus becoming wise. So whoever I'm following determines my future. That means I can sit back and strategically think if I want to be here, by the end of my life, let me find somebody that's already there. It's so simple. If you know you're called to a leadership position and you don't know Dr. Miles Monroe, you won't go very far because there's an there was an assignment. He's passed, of course, but there was an assignment on his life. He just didn't know about leadership. He got paid to teach leadership. So that can be a mentor for you. So you would sit down and create a routine. Not just reading one book off one book. No, no, no. You would sit down and create a study routine to study his materials. Why? Because you know the reason why he's at work, the place where he's at is because of his mind. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So every your your physical reality is a report card of your mindset. You are where you are right now because of your mind. It's just that simple. Your mindset is producing your results. The Bible says the thoughts of the righteous lead to plenteousness. Their, their thoughts alone are attracting certain results. There's a mindset that creates effective leadership. There's a mindset that creates uh, uh, influence. There's a mindset that creates a success. If I want to attain that goal, I have to find somebody with that requisite mindset. There's a mindset Miles Moreau has that makes him a leader. It's not by luck or by chance. If you read his books, one thing he's adamant about is that no one's just born to be a leader. It's by development. You develop certain ideologies, certain belief systems, certain value systems, and you conform yourself to be a leader. So you go study him, understudy him. If I was in the NBA and I said, I want to become the best shooter in the NBA, I'm going to study Stephen Curry because he's the best. Don't, don't, don't just, you see, there's a way you can try to just be nice and just say, you see, if you want to be a responsible Christian, you'll find out that now, now uh, I mean this humbly, but you'll find out that there are certain areas for all men, there are certain areas where maybe your immediate pastor may not be so strong in. Now, I'm not, that's not, that's all men. That's not just your, anybody, me, you, everyone. There are areas of your life where you need to strengthen. He said, follow them with th which through faith and patience have obtained. So there are areas which your pastor may not have obtained. He's also still growing. Nobody stops growing in this life. He's also still growing. So if his if he's teaching you, okay, this is kind of silly, but imagine if your pastor has had, God forbid, he's had five divorces and he's on the sixth divorce and he's teaching you about marriage. You can't say because he's my pastor, I'm going to listen to his counsel on that particular area because when it, maybe he's strong in other areas, maybe leadership, maybe finance, we'll listen to him, hooray. But when it comes to marriage, I, I honor him, I respect you, but when it comes, to, I won't say it, but when it comes to this area, if even if he's talking to me one-on-one, -on -one, I'll just be saying, yes, yes, dude, praise the Lord, but when I go home, I'm not going to be foolish enough to take, no. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Meaning you have the right, the moment he steps out of line and, do, and does something that Christ didn't do, you have the jurisdiction to not do it as well. So you don't have to follow men blindly, aimlessly, just because he's a man of God, I'm just going to follow him anyhow. No, no, no. If he's not, if he doesn't have results in that particular area, that's not your mentor. You find the one that's obtained that promise in that particular area. This is so powerful. This is this is one of the things that separate people is their mentorship. It's that simple. It's what they're exposed to. There's some people in the business area, ministry. There's a pastor that has 500,000 members and there's a pastor that has 500 members. It's a product of the mindset. If I want to obtain the result of church growth, it's not going to be because I just found a genuine man. No, I'm going to find the one that's obtained that result. You understand that? So there's that, right? There's Timothy and Paul. I wanted to give some examples there, but uh, with two minutes left, I'll end with this last point, uh, time conversion. You find your assignment. You find mentors in your areas of assignment. You find people who can, uh, who have attained what you want to obtain in that area of your calling. Now, the next thing is what's called the law of time conversion. Now you have to, it's not just enough to know these things. Like I said before, you have to now begin to build a routine. You have to begin to now convert time into value. Um, this is the part many people miss. There's, um, 
it's like anything else in life. We understand when we use other examples. When somebody says, I want to gain 30 pounds of muscle, what do you do? They begin to study how to do that and they build a routine. You see, and fry every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they do upper body, lower body, whatever the case may be. Now they're finding and building a system to be able to convert their time into value for the goal they're trying to meet. So if my goal, I'm called to the apostolic office and my assignment is A, B, C, and D. I found my mentors. Wonderful. Now I have to discipline myself to sit down and create a routine to study on what I need to study, to develop what I need to develop. Maybe you don't have the jurisdiction to be going out and hang on on Friday night. You have to be prayerful. You have to find a system where I can allocate three hours every day to dedicate to speaking in tongues. People don't, people don't do that. People don't live like that. That kind of self-governance to use your time and invest it, not just Friday, Saturday, I'm just hanging around, just watching Netflix. No, there's somebody who's watching Netflix on Saturday. And there's somebody who's also thinking of the next Netflix on Saturday. They're using their time differently. They both have 24 hours, but they're using it for different things. Somebody has a dollar. Another person has a dollar. One person uses it to buy chips. One person uses it and lends it to somebody and says, when you give it back, you have to give me back $2. And they're using $1 to multiply it. The other person is using $1 to spend it. We all have time. We're all using it differently. So if I know my assignment is such and such, my mentors are such and such, I create the allocated time to study on what I need to study and develop what I need to develop. I'm converting my time. There's a way you have to begin to now consecrate yourself and sit down and discipline yourself. You want to become a leader. I will sit down and I'll read two leadership books every week without stop. I don't care how tired I am. I don't care who's calling me. I don't care what. I will sit down and discipline myself two books every week. Miles Monroe said he read over 20 leadership books every year. There's no, there's no wonder why he's exceptional. A man reaps what he sows. You are only going to become the resultant effect of what you do every day. So if I can constrict myself to master my daily disciplines, to do everything I need to do in order to achieve it, it'll be done. I'm going to end here. Um, I'm going to end here with respect to time. Uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, this opportunity to speak. God bless you all. I want to hand over the, the next segment to the person leading prayer again. God bless you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you.